Our scripture reading this evening comes from the first chapter of James' epistle, James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. For if any lack, that's if they might want something, wanting nothing, the same word, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, is like the, a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because... As the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then... When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, which, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, 
but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Our text this evening, beloved, is found in verses 22 through 25 of this first chapter of James. James 1, 22 through 25, we read it again. But be ye, hearer, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It might seem to us when we read this first chapter that James is rather direct in the way in which he jumps right into this letter. Very second verse, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. James' concern and the, that which serves as the theme, really, of this letter is that those who profess to have faith live their faith. They don't just say they have it. They don't just put on Sunday clothes and go to church. But they live that faith. And then he jumps right into where, if you will, the rubber hits the road. And that is when you have some trial and some difficult time come upon you. Exercise your faith. Let your faith, your professed faith, evidence itself in the way in which you want to respond to that affliction, that trial, and realize that those difficulties aren't coming out of the blue and they're purposeless and they're no good, but Rather, observe that they are there to work and develop endurance in you. Patience, endurance, that your faith is exercised that way. Now, in verse 18 and then again in 21, we have a very important introduction to the text our text goes the step further then and says, let your faith be evidenced in that you do the work. You do the work. You're doers of the word. But doers of the word, faith is always going to be hearing the word. So he concludes, be swift to hear. Be swift to hear and slow to speak. Because realize this, the importance of the word, verse 18, God begat you by, with the word of truth. And then in verse 21, receive with meekness the engrafted word. The word's coming. Now that's interesting. God speaks. 
we are to exercise our ears. We are to be swift to hear, eager to hear. We want to hear. And again, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. It's that idea again, so that he will do the talking and we are to do the listening. And that word, that speech of our shepherd, of our God, that has power. 1 Corinthians 1, the preaching of Christ crucified, the word of Christ crucified, that's got the wisdom and the power of God to save the ones that God is pleased to save. Romans 1, who are the saved? The saved are the ones who call on the name of the Lord. The ones who call on the name of the Lord are the hearers. But the hearers hear the preaching of the word. So then it concludes, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So God begets us by the word of truth. We are to receive that word with meekness. We don't come and tell him what we expect him to tell us. We're not coming to hear a sermon and we've got it already figured out how it should be arranged and what he should tell us. No, we're going to be swift to hear and slow to speak. We're going to be swift to hear what he has to say. We're going to be open to him. And so with an attitude of meekness, we come to be taught. We are Marys who will serve him best by sitting at the knees of Christ. And we want to catch every word he says. We receive with meekness that word. That's the key to being a doer and not a hearer only. So we consider what it means to be a doer of the word. What does it take? First of all, we want to look at the hearers. There are groups of hearers that are spoken of and implied in our text. Secondly, what does it mean to be a doer itself? How does a hearer become a doer? What characterizes that hearer that's a doer? And then finally, we consider the blessing the blessing that he promises at the very end of this text to the doer. James writes this letter to a church institute, a congregation like this. He probably wrote not to one, but to many different congregations. And the letter goes around making copies being made of it, and it's read in many different instituted congregations on earth. What's the characteristic of a congregation that's instituted? You're going to have the preaching of the word. You're going to have the study of the word. The word is going to be brought to the adults. The word is going to be brought in the catechism rooms to the children. The word is going to be there. What's that word? The word is God proclaiming and declaring the truth about himself. God declaring the truth about himself. He speaks of himself. He declares himself. He speaks in creative word. He speaks in incarnated word. He speaks in inscripturated word. In the old dispensation, he spoke directly. Listen to those words that we had this morning out of Deuteronomy 5 after we read the Ten Commandments. They heard God. That speech of God assured them He lives. He is the living God. And that they could hear and remain alive assured them that they were living. That word of God 
proclaims himself. Now, that's never just a bunch of data that you can organize in an outlined way and find in a, in a dogmatics book, identifying God. We have it somewhat in that order in our catechism books. God. His essence or being, his persons, his attributes, his works, his works before time, his works inside himself, his works outside of himself, his work of creation, his work of providence, his work of redemption. That's the scriptures. But all of those works Persons, all that knowledge we gain about God that's taught us and is a part of the Word is a mirror. It's a mirror. Because you can't look at, or maybe this is a better way, you can't hear what God says about Himself without comparing yourself to Him, without seeing yourself in the light of Him. We're always comparing. Always. Nobody doesn't. Everybody does. How do I match up to... What is she wearing today. What grade did he get? What score did he get? We're always comparing. My team versus your team. Always comparing. But when God declares himself, then we see ourselves in the light of him. Now, that's what's called a mirror. He beholds himself in a glass. And so the first thing we're going to do is see ourselves compared to him. But now, this mirror of the knowledge of God that we see ourselves up against doesn't just show how we match up to God externally. This word that is the glass looks inside. Hebrews 4 tells us that that word penetrates into the very marrow of our being. Now, you get a bone. And you see the outside of a bone. The marrow of the bone is that which is in the very center of the bone. This knowledge that we get of God sets before us a holiness that is able with its light to penetrate to motives, to imaginations, to dreams, Genesis 6 speaks of the imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts. What we think. It looks at whether we are doing something out of love for God or love of self. It's able to see that. And it shows that. We're able to cover a lot up from everybody else. But when we look in the mirror of the Word of God and we do our comparing with Him, then He says, every thought of hatred, that's murder. Every thought of lust, that's adultery. He goes into our hearts, our thoughts. Now, as that Word goes out, in the instituted church, or churches, there are three kinds of hearers. 
Now think of the parable of the different soils. There were different soils, three bad. And then there are three good, some that produced 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. But, but look at those parables, and that will help you see the hearers. The first are those who are there, and they are rightly classified non-hearers, non-hearers. There is absolutely no penetration of the word into, well, being anywhere beneath the mind understanding what the words are saying. There's not a whole lot of interest. We sit here. We're able to, to look right. But when the seed of the word comes, it lands on our souls just like it would on this varnished piece of wood. If a seed would sit here, there would be absolutely no hope that that seed would ever sprout and produce anything. You just, right there. In the parable of the different soils, it's like landing on the hard path. It's landing on pavement, on cement. There it sits. Nothing's going to happen. Can't. The non-hearer. Then there are the hearers. They hear. They gather knowledge. They listen. They can tell you later what the word said, what the sermon was about. They're very good at repeating the last word. What was the last word? They can do it. They can talk about passages of Scripture. They will do it mostly from an intellectual perspective, but they will be able to be very good talkers about the Word. They will be excellent appliers mostly to others. He doesn't match up. She's not doing it right. They start doing that. They're on their road. That's going to take them downhill. They're very good judges. But the message does not take deep root. They can be, well, the stony ground hearers. That stony ground had a layer of dirt on top. And so that seed landed on the dirt. And it went into that soil. And it got the warmth and the moisture from the soil. And it sprouted. And, and it went down, but it couldn't go very deep. And it grew a little bit. It gave some evidence of growth. And it seemed to have good life. At first, but then it hit a solid layer of rock. Or it came into a different kind of soil where there was all kinds of other little seeds. And it went in, and it sprouted, and it grew, but so did the other seeds. And it hurt. And as it grew, it got choked out because it was concerned about the wrong things. Its concern was, what's my experience like in this world? How does this make me successful in this world? And they were concerned about what others said and what others thought. Matthew 13 says they are the seed, the life of that seed that they heard was choked out by the cares of the world. How they lived and how they appeared and how they conducted themselves, that got their attention and that choked out 
something that was very important that they heard, but they wanted to forget right away. A real hearer, the third, who is going to be a doer, Well, the text really catches us up short because we would expect that a doer of the word is going to be somebody who hears it and then lives it in their life. They do it. And that's true. That's true. But what does it take to be a doer? This is what catches us up short. What does it take to be a doer of the word? Look. They behold their natural face. They behold their natural face in this Mirror of the knowledge of God. Natural face means the face of our birth. That's what I am by virtue of my earthly conception. That defines my relationship to Adam. That's my original sin with its original guilt and its original corruption. That's a description of who and what I am by nature. Now, after God regenerates us, and the very core of our being is made new, we haven't gotten rid of that nature. We haven't lost it. We still have it. Our core has changed. But I'm still enveloped with the baggage of my old man. My filthy old man. To be a doer in distinction from a hearer only. Both, both are taught. They see the mirror of the Word of God, they see themselves in comparison, and both, the hearer only and the doer, they see themselves and they say, look at what I am by nature. But the hearer only straightway forgetteth. Straightway, of course, is immediately. He will do his best to forget what he sees about himself. Because he forgets what manner of man he was. And that is something that's pretty ugly. You don't ever, it's, it's like some of those quick snapshots that people take of you when you're not ready. And you don't want that picture shown anywhere. You don't want to see. You want to burn it. Dump that one. Delete it. But that's what all of us have to see all the time. When we're not ready to smile. We see the inside. We see that about ourselves. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to live in the realization that that's there. And that's going to be with me until I die. I am regenerated. But that's me too. One who is a doer sees that And look at the difference. The hearer only straightway forgetteth. 
but he who is a doer, look at the middle of 25, continues therein. He never allows himself to forget. He works hard to keep before his mind the awareness that he is a sinner. That he is sinful. That he cannot do anything good. Some of you have talked about this with me that just as a little reminder, a little funny way to do it, but when a waitress comes and says, do you want some more coffee and we're full, and we say, no, I'm good, that then we try to find all different ways to say it now because Reverend Van Overloop is going to say, no, you're not good, you're a sinner saved by grace. You're not good. You can't say, I'm good. How are you today? I'm... That's just a little way. And it's probably not the, most, the best way. It's not the best way. Because you've got to live, you've got to continue in the knowledge of what I look like. Not in comparison, because Reverend Van Overloop is going to catch me, but God sees me. And that's what I need always to remember. Because that's me. Does it make sense now that the one who is the hearer and doer receives the engrafted word with meekness? Does it surprise you that what doth God require of you, O oh man? Does He, for the sin of your soul, require the fruit of your body, your children, to be burned up for Him? What doth the Lord require of thee but to walk humbly with thy God? To do justly. And to love, love mercy. Love what it is to be recipient of undeserved favor. The doer, he'll talk about others. He'll point out the sins of others. But whenever he does, he does it with tremendous understanding. And whenever he does it, he goes in this awareness. I'm chief. His favorite words whenever he approaches God is mercy, have mercy, grace, give me grace. Because mercy is for the miserable and grace is for the ugly and undeserving. And he knows that. He hears the Pharisee talk about him. But he ignores him because far more important than what that Pharisee thinks of him is what God thinks of him. Be merciful to me, the sinner. Before God and others, he lives in the awareness Oh, wretched man that I am. I think it's true of you too, but oh, wretched man that I am. That gets my attention. That's the doer. 
You're not going to be a doer of the word unless you start, continue, and end with this thought. What is my natural face? What is my old man? I am a sinner. I sin, but I am sinful. He who is a hearer only can talk excitedly about ecclesiastical matters, church things, thinks that's great, but never with meekness. Highly critical of others. Oh, he can say, I'm a sinner too. But you always get a feel that it's just words. What do you and I sound like? What do we look like? Now, when we remember our natural face, when we remember who and what we are, before this holy, holy, holy God, not as I compare to everybody else, but how I compare to Him. That's, and we're here, we got a regenerated heart, that's when this mirror is converted. And instead of looking in a glass, look at what we look into. Verse 25. We look into what the King James says is the perfect law of liberty. We look in, perfect means complete or completed. We look into a law that doesn't hammer us and knock us down and leave us a pile of pulp. But we confessing and admitting and asking for mercy are assured that all who come unto him he will in no wise cast out because it's the knowledge of my sin that gives vent to a voice that says have mercy help give me grace I can't I'm unable help we cry for mercy and God promises to hear every cry. In no wise, absolutely impossible, is it for God to close his ear to the cry of such a sinner. And, and then we look at that, that God who's three times holy. And what do we see? We see him saying to us, I've completed the law. I fulfilled the standard that I've set for you in my son. And now this law doesn't bind us in the slavery of sin. It's a law of liberty. I'm freed from the guilt of sin. I'm freed from having to sin. I am free to do what's right and good in thanks to God. It's always going to be. My freedom is first, second, third, tenth, a hundred and tenth. This, I'm a sinner. Forgiven. Saved. Redeemed. By that God who has given me his son. That's a doer. The word declares that the law is completed. It's been perfected by his own son. So what's the blessedness? The blessedness, beloved people of God, 
is that we're going to start to do that word this way. What does it mean to be an active doer? What's the activity of the doer? One. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. He's a repenter. She's asking for forgiveness. Because I don't forget my natural face. That's blessedness. The world is going to say, you admit you did wrong? And the child of God says, yes. I admit it. And that's freedom. Notice that last part of verse 22. Those who are hearers only, look at what it says about them. They've deceived themselves. We deceive ourselves when we buy into the worldly thinking, don't admit you did anything wrong. All we do is just lock ourselves up and fool ourselves. We put, we put a, a blinder on ourselves. Blindfold. Can't see. Will you look? Everybody knows we're sinners who we tried to trick. Just ourselves. Because this is what I really am. A sinner. Godly sorrow. Saved. Saved. Because the sinner asks for mercy. The sinner is praying for grace. Oh, God, be merciful to me. Son of David, we cry out, have mercy upon me. The knowledge of our guilt is expressed in a cry for help. Whosoever shall call upon the call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls is saved. So the preaching showing to us our sin is the same preaching that opens our eyes to the Savior. And we call. If I don't think I'm drowning and dead, I'm not going to call. But if I see myself drowning, I'm going to call. If I think I can fool everybody, then I'm okay. I don't need help. Godly sorrow. Hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Then third, the blessedness of is the blessedness of one who is a doer. Now, we would think a doer of the word. No. Verse 25 says, Blessed is the one who is a doer of the work. What is that work? It's what the scriptures call they keep. They are a keeper. This past week, in Wednesday night, in Bible study, we read in from Luke 11 about a woman who was looking and listening to Jesus and then in absolute amazement lifted up her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Rome built its mariolatry on that kind of a thought. Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Jesus did not say no. He said, yay, she's blessed. Listen to what the angel said of her. Blessed art thou among women. 
But then he changed it. Yea, rather. This is what he said. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now, the realization is nobody can keep that perfectly. To keep it is to have that willingness, one, to submit to God's will. How was it that Mary was so blessed? How did she keep it? Here comes an angel to her. Says, Mary, you're not going to know a man, but you're going to become pregnant. And it's going to be a horrible embarrassment to you to be pregnant. And everybody's going to say, ha, oh, what a sinner. And you're going to have to bear that shame. And you're going to have a son. And you're going to wonder about him all kinds of times. You're going to ponder all kinds of things about him in your heart because you don't know what kind of thing. And he's going to bring embarrassment upon your other children and upon you at times. Blessed is they who hear the word and keep it. But when you submit and say, this is God's will for me. It is God's will that I have this income. It is God's will that I be placed and live in the year 2012 and not 1912. It is God's will that I have this relationship with these people. Keep His word. Accept that will of God as right and good Count it all joy. And exercise your faith to love him and them. To love him and yourself as he does and them. Let gratitude for that love that faileth never and that grace that abideth ever and for that mercy that's always, always, always coming. Let gratitude for that be the powerful incentive and motive to love Him. That's what it is to keep His commandments, to trust that His will for me, this is where He wants me, this is what's best for me, I accept his wisdom and I trust his love. Then, then you show it by being swift to hear and slow to speak. Or as he says it in verse 26, you bridle your tongue. You control your mouth. You don't just blurt. You just don't say what you think. You've got a bridle there. You do it also by visiting the fatherless and the widows. You who receive nothing but mercy, serve mercy. Not to those that are grateful, because it sure is gives a good feeling to be appreciated. No, mercy is we give without any feedback. To be a doer of the word is to strive to keep oneself unspotted from the world. He who is a hearer only is choked out by the cares of the world. Keeps himself guarded, lest the world make him dirtier. That's the blessing of the doer. May God give us the grace 
never to forget, to work hard to remember that though we have a new man in Christ, we've got an old man that requires killing, mortifying constantly. If I let him go, if I don't kill him, he's going to get the best. And instead, out of gratitude for what I have been given in Christ, I love Him and serve Him. Amen. Father, we thank Thee again. Thy Word comes. May we receive it with meekness. May we delight in what Thou dost teach us. And may the fruit of it that we walk humbly with thee and with each other. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.